Today's reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyards. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out at about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And at about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. And when those hired at about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. And now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us. You have, we who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to, to the one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I give to you. I am, not, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. And a second reading we have today from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through your faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. From ancient India comes the story of a student and his master who were talking one day and the master decided to teach the student a lesson about creation. All creation, said the master, all the birds of the air, the fishes in the sea, the ocean, the sky, the mountains, everything that you see around you, it all rests on a gigantic turtle. Student looked at his master quizzically. A turtle? Yes, said the master with confidence. A turtle. Student thought about this and being the kind of petulant uh, young fellow that some of us were, he came back to his teacher, but, but what does the turtle sit on? Teacher didn't miss a beat. The, tur the teacher said, an even bigger turtle. Well, this got the student really going, and he said, Okay, I got to know, what does that turtle sit on? Another turtle, said the teacher. By this time, the student was really frustrated, and he said, Okay, and what does that turtle sit on? I know, another turtle. You got it, said the teacher with confidence. It's turtles all the way down. When you get all the way down to the heart of it, to the heart of who we are as Methodists. It's all about an understanding, our understanding of grace and how God works in our lives. This is the foundation of the Wesleyan way. And more than any other single text, did you know John Wesley preached on the passage we just heard from Ephesians, for by grace have you been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, lest any of us should boast. It is grace, grace that made us, grace that will save us, grace that will lead us home. 
Usually, when we speak of grace, we talk about it as undeserved mercy. It's both an affirmation of God's nature and uh, an observation about how we respond. Now, more often than not, when John Wesley was talking about God, he used not a monarchical model, but a, a parental model, which is to say he talked about and thought about God not as a monarch, a king, a judge, but rather as a loving, kind parent. Now that doesn't mean that we as God's children don't mess up. We do. We need a little help. And sometimes we need a whole lot of help. I don't know about you, but I need a whole boatload of it. And the key to understanding the relationship between grace and faith is to know that always, always God's grace comes first. That God takes the initiative in the dance. Before we ever do anything, God acts. If you can memorize Ephesians 2.8, you really do get the heart of who we are theologically as Methodists. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not the result of works, lest any of us should boast. It's God's initiative. God's the one who takes the first step. God alone opens the door through which we can walk. It's then up to us to walk through that door. And if you're picturing it graphically, and you've got to see it graphically, this is the way it looks like. God taking the initiative, and then we as human beings responding. And this is faith. It's our response. One of John Wesley's favorite persons to quote in this regard was St. Augustine, who said, uh, God who made us without ourselves will not save us without ourselves. Or the way John Wesley put it, first, God works, therefore you can work. Secondly, God works, therefore you must work. There is grace and there is response. And in a very real way, our Methodist way is to hold together these two, grace and faith, in a creative tension, or what one person called a conjunctive theology, we believe in this and that, together. One Methodist historian said, John Wesley, like a good oarsman, looked one way and rowed another. When it comes to the core, the heart, the central part of our salvation, we look to God's grace and we row, row, row. To this end, Jesus told a story. We call his stories parables. They're puzzles that make us look one way and go another. And that's certainly the case with today's parable. A man owns a vineyard. It's the time of year when the weather is just starting to change and the harvest is in. He's got a vineyard that is ripe with the most beautiful, big, bountiful clusters of grapes swollen, pregnant with juicy red fruit. It's harvest time. And on a chosen day at 6 a.m., he goes out to the town square, right? And he sees all these guys standing around, and he says, you want a job? They say, sure, we'd love a job, uh, but how much will you pay us? And they go back and forth, and they agree on a certain day's wage. Now, they get to work. Three hours pass, and at 9 a.m., the guy is back in the town square looking to see who else he can get to come work for him. He finds some folk, and they come on back. And then the same thing at 12 o'clock, and the same thing again at 3 o'clock. He's getting everybody he can find because it is a honking big harvest, right? But then the man does a really weird and unusual thing. At 5 o'clock, he goes to the town square, and it happens again. Now, 
In that day and in that culture, the work day was from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a 12-hour work day from dawn to dusk. And this guy has gone out just with an hour left in the day. Once again, he finds people standing around idle. Why are you standing around idle, he asks. Because no one's hired us all day? Duh. Well, I don't know about you, but I have an idea about the kind of people that no one would hire all day. You know who I'm talking about. The folk who are lazy, the folk who are always depending on others, the folk who are maybe spending the morning getting over a bender from the night before. The drug addicts, the drunkards, the kind of folk who no one else will hire. Maybe they're a little bit spaced out from the night's parting before. But the man says to them, you also go into the vineyard. And they do. They work one hour right alongside those who'd work three hours, six hours, nine hours, and 12 hours that long 12-hour day. But then the whistle, bo- the whistle blows. yabba dabba That's a cultural reference, and I appreciate some of you getting that. <laughs> Line them up, says the boss to the foreman. Time for pay. Starting with those who just got here and ending with those who worked all day. Each worker gets an envelope. Now, those who had just gotten there and had only spent one hour, they peep into their envelope thinking, well, if I could at least get enough to buy another bottle of wine, right? But then they look and it's, holy cow, it's a full day's wage. And they're whooping and jumping and high-fiving all around. It's a party, right? And word gets down to the other end of the line. What are they so happy about? And word gets down, well, they got a whole day's wage. And the people on the other end of the line, they're thinking, whoa, that's a big payday for us. But then they look in their envelopes, and it's the same amount. What's the deal, they say to the foreman? The boss paid them a full day's wage. We should get more. They're furious. And can you blame them? You mean you made these one-hour guys equal to us? We work 12 long, sweaty hours. And you give these bums who dilly-dally all day and pick just a few grapes in the sunset the same amount? I don't know about you, but I'm right with those who are voicing the outrage. Can you feel it? Can you feel the injustice? i got to admit, I felt it this week. It was Thursday night. Debbie had given us a night off from the desserts. And we were having friends, uh, having dinner with friends in Fenton. Right? You know how long it takes to get to Fenton. Well, we left at 5 o'clock and decided to stop at Schnucks to pick up something to take them as a gift. And we get on the interstate just shortly after 5 o'clock on First Capital, heading east. And immediately we're locked in this gigantic traffic jam. Would you believe, and I have the GPS sitting there telling me how much time before we're supposed to arrive at our friend's house. And uh, I'm watching the minutes click off the clock. And would you believe it took us 20 minutes just to get from First Capital to the 370 bridge? My blood pressure was starting to ratchet up. But then I see these flashing lights in my mirror. It's the tow truck coming. Hot dog. We're saved, right? And so we move over into... The, the next lane, and so do all the other cars, and the tow truck goes whizzing by. But just as he whizzes by, some Yahoo in a sports car whips around and follows him all the way to the head of the line, and then he cuts in and zoom, he's gone. 
None of you are driving that sports car, I hope, please. It'd be my luck to discover it was somebody here. But my blood pressure at that moment was about ready to burst. It's not fair. Have you been there? Or maybe, maybe you're a student and you study really hard for a test because you're a conscientious sort, right parents? That's the kind of kid you raised. And you study really hard for a test and it's a big test, but you do good. You get the grades back and you get an A. But then this little cutie pie missy comes bebopping up to you and says, what do you get? Now, Missy never studies a lick. She just sits there and doodles and looks cute while you're studying your brains out. And she says, what do you get? What do you get? And you kind of hem and haw because you're nice and you don't want her to feel bad. And, but finally, you relent to her pressure and you say, I got an A. She says, cool, me too. <laughs> Didn't your work just get devalued? And then some cheerful egalitarian comes along and says, why are you ticked? She got an A, you got an A. It's all the same thing, right? And you say, it's not the same thing. One more example. You got a job and you get a salary and you work hard. You come to work early and you stay late and you take work home with you. But like almost all of us, you got somebody who's over you, somebody who makes way more money than you. And then comes word through the company that it's been a good year and everybody's going to get a 3% raise. And you should be happy, but then you think, I get 3%, but my boss, who doesn't work nearly as hard as I do, gets a 3% raise, and their 3% is way more than my 3%. Fairness? I don't think so. But here's how the boss replies to the leader of the grievance committee. He says, listen, pal. I've done you no wrong. Didn't we agree to a day's wage? Take what you earned and get out. Am I not allowed to do with my money what I choose to do with? And, and are you envious because I am generous? And the question just hangs out there. The parable doesn't report any answer to that question as if it's meant to hang out there for us. Are you envious because I am generous? How would you respond? And why is it that in this story almost all of us to a person want to identify with those who've worked the hardest? The ones who felt cheated. And how did Jesus know that almost all of us would respond like those who felt like they didn't get enough, that they didn't get their fair share? How is it that Jesus knew that almost all of us have perfected the sideways glance, you know, always looking at what our sister or our brother gets? or our neighbor, or our friend, and measuring our life by theirs. You reckon? You reckon he told this parable to expose that kind of ugly part of ourselves and to invite us to get over it already? How? Maybe by reevaluating which end of the line we're really standing in. I mean, do we fit, do we really fit the image and the, the picture of the person who has served the purposes of Christ from the dawn of their life to the dusk of their life, giving everything to be a disciple? Have we really been so hard at it and so good at it? And further, are we really 
the people who are in a position to strike a bargain with God, who've done everything that God would expect of us. How about it? How would you say we've held up to our part of the bargain? Friends, we've got no bargain with God at all, even if we're foolish enough to think we did. God never promised any of us a wage. God just came to find us and give to us a beautiful life to call us to a higher purpose, to crown our lives with meaning, and to set us into the company of those who are truly blessed. Standing in the payment line, we've been much too quick to notice how certain generosities have apparently been handed to others and not to us. So how about it? How about if we rub our eyes and look again? This isn't the bargaining end of the line that you and I are standing in. It's the blessed line where grace abounds, where there's all kinds of good reason for whooping and high-fiving and joy all around. Before us is the gift of life, the wondrous universe itself, and the one who gave his life for us. Who among us has earned this? And if we didn't earn it, how, how could we ever begrudge God who so freely gives? Let this be our reason today for laughing and joy and dancing and jumping and high fives all around. This is the grace that we have received. How will you respond?